The Resistance franchise was a first-person shooter developed from 2006 to 2011. It had three main console releases, the first of which happened to be my first time in the genre. Blending action, science fiction and horror, it received mostly good critical reception but didn't manage to reach classic status in the eyes of fans. In this retrospective, I'll be looking at all three mainline entries in the franchise. Due to the online servers being shut down by Sony in 2014, I'm unable to comment on the multiplayer modes, so I'll be focusing mainly on the single player campaigns. Let's begin. On November 17th, 2006, or March 23rd, 2007 for the UK, the PlayStation 3 needed a launch title to move units. The road to the seventh generation of consoles had been rocky for Sony. A poor performance at E3 2006 the previous year, endless ramblings about processing power, and not much talk about proper games. When the console arrived on the market, the always reliable Insomniac Games, creators of the Ratchet & Clank series, stepped up to the plate with Resistance Fall of Man. It quickly became the linchpin of the system's launch lineup, and subsequently took the lead for the PS3's initially slow trickle of exclusive titles. How does it hold up today? Moderately well for the most part. Resistance Fall of Man takes place in an alternate 1950s history where instead of World War II, Earth instead falls victim to the invasion of the Chimera, an alien menace hell-bent on assimilating all of humanity. Beginning in the frozen waste of Siberia, they quickly overcame all of Europe and eventually Great Britain along with it. The franchise begins with an American operation looking to liberate the nation from the monsters. Told via these grainy war photographs and narration, Fall of Man's story has some well-established grounding and an unreliable narrative to its recount-based structure. Right from the word go, there's a tantalizing mystery as to where the Chimera came from, but while the premise is intriguing and firmly grounded in horror, the story doesn't make good on its narrative. We learn next to nothing about the human characters in the game. Your character, Sergeant Nathan Hale, interestingly voiced by the voice of Clank, David Kay, is mostly a blank and grizzled soldier, barely speaking throughout the game. Occasionally side characters will comment on this silence, but it doesn't make up for a lack of character development. He's mostly an avatar for the player and nothing more. The same is true of Captain Rachel Parker. While her narrations are well performed by Cornelia Hayes O'Healy, the fact that we barely see her across the game's 10 chapters isn't very impactful. The one exception to the rule though is Lieutenant Stephen Cartwright, voiced by Peter Jessup. While we don't get his backstory, he brings a charismatic British wit whenever he's on screen. It also helps that when you fight alongside him, his aim with both a sniper and machine gun turret easily trump the basic soldiers that fight alongside you. Despite these faults, Fall of Man does lay a few nuggets across its story mode. Intel documents fill in the backstory, and you'll occasionally stumble upon these masked soldiers who fell while operating outside of the core military operations. More on them later. From a gameplay standpoint, the original Resistance offers a fast-paced and twitchy combat system that takes the player through 10 chapters comprised across 10 different locales. You'll fight as Sergeant Nathan Hale either alone or with a supporting army in an array of operations throughout England. Rather than a full sandbox with the player, allies and enemies all reacting to each other, Resistance Full of Man compromises with a semi-linear approach. There's a definitive path to follow, but the levels aren't all tight corridors with no room to manoeuvre. The same is also true of the health system, which represents Hale's exposure to viral infection. Somewhere in between Call of Duty's regenerative health and the number-based system of classic shooters, each of the four bars could be regenerated one at a time, but if a bar is lost, the player will have to scrounge for these yellow canisters, which look a bit like Bacta tanks from the Star Wars universe. By playing conservatively and taking cover before a health bar is depleted, the player can conserve Hale's vitality and reduce the number of pickups needed to win firefights. It's a necessity on higher difficulty levels. In combat, it's up to the player to come up with their own strategies to push through, to leverage the arsenal of weapons in their favour. Luckily, with over 10 different firearms, there's plenty of room for experimentation. If there's one characteristic that could sum up Insomniac in the 2000s, it would be making cool guns and Fall of Man picks up where Ratchet and Clank left off on the PlayStation 2. Every weapon feels distinctive, and this is down to several factors. 
First, the sound design. Each of the armaments has a unique and created noise when you equip or fire it, allowing the player to qu identify them quickly. Then there's the alternate fire mode, and these form the backbone of Resistance's identity in the genre. Even over a decade later, the series still offers a venerable FPS arsenal that few can match. The base carbine has a grenade launcher, the bullseye shoots tags that cause bullets to home in on enemies, the auger shoots through walls, and the far eye slows down time for those oh so important headshots. My personal favourite though is the hailstorm. an experimental US heavy machine gun with bullets that can bounce off the walls or turn into an auto turret. It looks and sounds fantastic, but its reduced ammo count ensures you can't rely on it constantly. Combining the weapons and their unique functions together is the heart of the gunplay in Resistance. It was a very wise move on the developer's part to duck the two weapon limit. Take this scenario in London for example. I take cover in a small room, mine the doorway with the sapper, take out the far eye to deal with enemies in the distance, then use the base assault weapons to mop up the stragglers on ground level. Fall of Man is always encouraging you to switch things up as it gradually introduces more armaments and enemies as the campaign goes on. Then you have the antagonists. Stripping back their lore and history, the Chimera are suitably menacing as opponents. Their ugly bastards, a hideous merging of organic and mechanical material, Fall of Man, being the first game in the franchise, does a reasonable job of fleshing them out. The first chapter in York gets the player straight into the action, an opening assault that quickly turns into a devastating hellhole. Helicopters spin out of control, explosions go off all around the player, and countless soldiers meet their end quickly. To cap off the opening sequence, the Chimera unleash their infectious crawlers on the unsuspecting American forces. It's a gruesome moment as the superfast bugs crawl their way inside the soldiers. Hale, however, wakes up and continues his mission, the only trooper not to fall into a coma. Later, in the Grimsby chapter, where the game's horror elements are put front and centre, the Chimera's creation is demonstrated through cutscenes and gameplay. This chapter scared the hell out of me when I first played it, and it's mostly down to the Maniles, the servant strain of the virus. There's a heavy dose of body horror in the en enemy design, the ultimate effect of the Chimeran virus that mutates humans into their ranks. Some NPC animations, like these ones, show off their brutality in a way the previous generation of consoles couldn't accomplish, and sometimes you'll head into an area watching them perform some activity. Their intelligence in battle, though, does leave much to be desired. There are generally three patterns on show. Enemies that stay at a close to medium distance and pepper you with their projectile weapons, weaker creatures that swarm you at close range with melee attacks, and larger mini-bosses who use a combination of both, like the Titan. There's decent variation in the Chimera you'll encounter, but nevertheless they all require similar tactics to take down. Simply pump them full of rounds and explosives until they fall, or in other cases, explode in a satisfyingly bloody effect. Again, the variation in the shooting comes not from dynamic enemy behaviour, but from the weapons themselves. Hybrids do look a bit awkward peeking out of cover, and often require a double tap to be put down permanently. Most of the time, they'll act under scripted patterns that rarely change. In this part of the Manchester chapter, I'm hiding behind the crate to let my health recharge. This hybrid could easily rush me with a melee attack, but simply stands there and lets me blow him away with the Rosmore. Later on in the game, Fall of Man throws nastier Chimeran creatures at you, the most notable being the Widowmakers and Angels. With their more Lovecraftian look, these feel especially unnerving, and can easily kill Hale with a single attack. As ugly as the Chimeran creatures look, the environments they fight in aren't quite as engaging. While the signs of battle are evident everywhere you look, the visuals are rather bland. Reviewers in 2006 pointed out that Resistance Fall of Man's mixture of browns and greys wasn't too visually appealing, and I agree with them on that count. With some exceptions, Fall of Man can look uninteresting at times, especially environments like this one in Nottingham. 
It's aiming to convey a muddy, stained look, but at the same time the environments could have had more variation. Perhaps some extra detail on weather effects too. In Bristol, you get a spot of rain which looks superficial at best. Even if the levels have a similar look, the first resistance does do a decent job of capturing England's architecture. Seeing some of the larger, more recognisable buildings devastated by bombings really hammers home the Chimeran might. One building, the Manchester Cathedral in the game's third chapter, caused some controversy with its real-life church leaders, who felt the place of worship shouldn't have been used in a combat scenario. Sony issued an apology in July 2007, and ironically, the argument actually boosted both sales of the game and visits to the cathedral itself. The only corridor-based level in the game, Northern Command in Cheshire, is claustrophobic and unnerving, with Chimera jumping out to surprise the player. Very direct scares, but they don't diminish the sense of isolation. On the other side of the coin, we have wholly Chimeran-made structures. These tunnels in the Bracknell chapter feel especially gloomy, with plenty of snaking conduit cables jutting out of the walls. Walking the same steps as the Chimera with the bodies of unnamed soldiers strewn about feels particularly eerie. The soundtrack is also strong, Distinguished from other shooters by its use of the trumpets, it embodies the alternate history of the series with a combination of military marches and more sinister undertones. From start to finish, the audio design is far superior to the visuals. Breaking up the action are a collection of smaller set pieces layered throughout the game. Most of these, however, are hit and miss. A total of six vehicle sections vary up the pace, but only a third of these are wholly satisfying. It's fun to blow up Chimeran hybrids in the Sabertooth tank, but these sequences take place in narrow corridors and are practically impossible to lose. But where the tank falters, the LUP Lynx excels. In the expansive fields of Somerset, you'll tackle Chimeran installations smashing through obstacles and running over hybrids while Cartwright mans the turret. Thanks to the car's high speed and responsive control, this is easily one of the best moments in the campaign. Then there's the Chimeran Stalker tank, which can be traced back to 2005's Ratchet Gladiator. At first you'll fight this lumbering monstrosity that can easily mow you down with its Gatling gun, but later in the game you'll get to drive it. Sadly, what should be an empowering experience often feels incredibly limited. The first time you use it in the closing moments of Southern Command in Bristol, the section is over in less than two minutes. The second time it's used is in London to take on a hulking Goliath boss, where all you have to do is hold down the trigger and dodge left and right to win. With Fall of Man being the only franchise entry with drivable vehicles, this is a massively wasted opportunity. As a launch title, some aspects of Fall of Man couldn't be fleshed out fully, and the Stalker is the most glaring example of this. Then you have the more miscellaneous segments, levels start and end with a simple fade in fade out effect, and we have the PS3 short lived motion control gimmick being used to shake off grapple attacks, another direct means of scaring the player that feels more gratuitous than anything else. Travelling from place to place throughout the game, Resistance Fall of Man comes to a head, fittingly enough, in London. There's a good sense of build up as Hale starts off alone in the city outskirts, mounts up in a tank to clear a landing zone, and then joins up for, with the armed forces for the climactic push. From here, the nation's capital brings the most challenging battles in the game, placed against a cold, snow-filled backdrop. Every last member of the British forces, along with reinforcements from the Americans, converges on a single target, the, the gargantuan A Tower that contains the Chimera's headquarters. As Hale puts it, if we destroy the tower, we destroy the Chimera. The structure itself feels suitably imposing, reaching higher than any other building in the city, and even covering entire districts the closer you get to its entrance. Leaving a wounded Cartwright behind, Hale enters the lift and the game's final chapter begins. Traversing the Chimeran Tower interior is very reminiscent of Half-Life 2. The vast and expansive structures stretch out before the player, and you'll come across larger, ugly-looking cocoons that may hold titans or other larger creatures.
The blend of nature with machine gives way to a full-on metallic look that speaks to how pivotal it is to the monster's hold over the country. Hybrids are, are replaced by advanced versions that do more damage. Every species you've encountered throughout the game is thrown into the mix, and you finally fight the powerful angels directly. One ugly motherfucker. All is not perfect though. There's one annoying section towards the end where you have to deal with two angels while advanced hybrids fire at you in every direction from platforms. With a limited amount of cover and health packs, this sequence can feel cheap. Muscle through it though, and you'll reach the finale. It's a straightforward objective. Blow up the four rods on the central reactor while fending off enemies, and you win. Part of me was hoping for a final boss, but the combat is still satisfying enough to make it worthwhile. The destruction of the London Tower creates a chain reaction across all the other towers, single-handedly obliterating the Chimeran threat throughout Britain. While the nation is successfully liberated, Nathan Hale, the greatest asset in this victory, is nowhere to be found. Officially, he's listed as killed in action at the game's conclusion, and Fall of Man wraps things up quite modestly, talking of civilians for the first time alongside some brief send-offs for Parker and Cartwright. Of course, Resistance wouldn't stop at a single game. A final morsel awaits players at the game's last cutscene, a sequel setup that's done moderately well. The elusive masked soldiers whose bodies are littered throughout the game find Hale in the snowy outskirts of London. The scar protagonist considers blowing himself up with his last grenade, but ultimately boards the helicopter and jets off with the sequel. Fall of Man's plot may be okay at best, but moments like these done without any dialogue are still effective. All in all, Resistance Fall of Man offered a solid springboard for a franchise, with enough competent systems to expand upon. Many players, myself included, who picked it up on the PlayStation 3's launch day, were generally eager to see what would happen next. What we would get with Resistance 2 ended up being a considerable step backwards. Two years on from its launch, and the PS3 was steadily crawling back from the ridicule it had received from the gaming community, 2008 saw the release of Little Big Planet and Metal Gear Solid 4, which really got gamers to run out and buy the console. Resistance 2, the last of the major exclusives that year, received glowing reviews on release, with many proclaiming it was bigger and better than the first game in every way. Over a decade after its release, I can't help but feel that this reception, along with the title itself, was a product of the time. In 2008, we were one year into the mainstream FPS craze that had been kicked off by Infinity Ward's Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare. That game single-handedly changed the genre and online multiplayer forever, and every single developer on the market was forced to take notice whether they liked it or not. As a result, many shooters in the years that followed felt they had to imitate its design, most notably with a higher focus on multiplayer and the campaign sometimes left as an afterthought. Regretfully, R2 is one of those games. Outside of its increased scale, a few fun boss fights, and relentlessly bleak story, the sequel to Fall of Man regresses massively. While its multiplayer was incredibly ambitious with 60 player online matches and a unique 8 player cooperative mode, the single player portion has aged very poorly, and replaying it hammered home the reasons why. Picking up immediately after Fall of Man left off, R2 follows the Chimera's invasion of the United States, a gargantuan attack that quickly overwhelms the nation. The returning Nathan Hale, still infected by the Chimeran virus, attempts to fight them off with the assistance of the Sentinels, troopers who also have the parasite running through their veins. While it starts off as a story bent on upping the ante, the game stumbles quickly. After taking up the use of basic rendered cutscenes, R2 takes the development problems of the original story and makes them worse, most notably by making every character a seriously straightforward military grunt with barely any kind of personal deve development. Hale, once again played by David Kay, speaks a lot more than he did in the original game, but this isn't used to have him comment on events or generate some character development. He simply speaks to advance the plot and nothing more. He has no reaction to the virus eating away at his body, and the same is true of his compatriots. Benjamin Warner and Aaron Hawthorne are fairly bland throughout, and Joseph Capelli is so aggressively unlikable that you may end up resenting the latter half of the cutscenes. It's possible this was meant to demonstrate their decaying humanity, but it doesn't excuse the overarching problem. The other major issue I have are the time jumps, 
After the prologue chapter, Resistance 2 jumps ahead two years and throws the player into more combat without any kind of introduction to other characters. We learn nothing about what Hale was up to at that time, and are instead told by other characters about the greater picture. It turns out that the sergeant's resistance to the Chimeran virus was no accident, as he had been selected for Project Abraham. Ran by the Special Research Projects Administration, or SERPA, the protagonist was injected with a controlled dose of the Chimeran virus in an effort to create soldiers better suited to battling the Chimera. All of this material is ripe with intrigue, but Resistance 2 does a poor job of communicating it. To the game's detriment, we are told all this by other characters directly, rather than finding out organically on our own throughout the game. Aspects of the Chimera and their origins are elaborated on slightly with the returning intel documents and this sequence in Bryce Canyon, Utah, but Resistance 2 is too focused on other things to properly develop these details. You simply watch a cutscene for a few seconds and then get back to the shooting. From the moment it begins in Iceland, two things are apparent in R2's design. First is the game's massive scale. When the player initially takes control, they see a Goliath tank towering over them, setting things up for a dramatically bigger experience. Then Richard Blake gives Hale a magnum and he follows the Major, gradually being spoon-fed information about characters and the greater context surrounding them. When contrasted with the semi-linear levels of its predecessor, R2 is extremely restrictive and limited. You're herded down mainly straight corridors to take on enemy groups and sometimes wait around for your AI teammates to catch up for the next area transition. Then you get down to the core gameplay itself, which has drastically changed from the original. We have regenerative health as opposed to four health bars, a two weapon limit, clicking the right stick for a melee attack, and a slower, more rigid feeling movement speed. If those gameplay systems sound familiar to you, it's because they're meant to be. Resistance 2 falls directly in line with Call of Duty, and it did so at a time when where players were far from tired of that gameplay style. We hadn't reached FPS saturation point yet, and by appealing to a wider audience, R2 ultimately capitulated. Removing the extra buffer of health means Hale is very fragile as a protagonist, and it's harder to tell whether the next round of gunfire from the enemy will put you on the verge of death or kill outright. Then, there's the two weapon limit, a very baffling decision that makes R2's arsenal woefully situational. The game's weapons feel a bit lackluster when compared to the first. Most of the new guns are straightforward ballistic devices with little in the way of imaginative alternate fire options. The Marksman, a riff on Halo's battle rifle, Look at him. He's scared shitless. and the Wraith chain gun, feel somewhat powerful. But the limitations remain. The most exotic weapon, the razor blade shooting splicer, feels insufficient. Why slowly chip away at the enemy's health when you can eliminate them with standard bullets? Rather than being able to experiment with every gun, Resistance 2 sees fit to give you the armament it wants you to use. See enemies far off in the distance? You'll get a far eye sniper. Are you about to be swarmed by foes at close range? Pick up the Rosmore shotgun conveniently left for you on the floor. Are there large mini-boss enemies on the way? Here. Have a Lark rocket launcher or pulse cannon. This feels incredibly stripped when compared to the first game. Having only two weapons, often with limited ammo, severely limits your options on the battlefield. To survive each skirmish, you mainly need to play the way the game wants you to, with little room for experimentation. All these elements combined turn Resistance 2 into something no FPS wants to be, a dull shooting gallery with inconsistent difficulty and countless cheat deaths. These bad decisions for the core gameplay could have been forgiven if the Chimera themselves were fun to fight, but they too have gotten worse between games. 
Resistance 4 of Man had three AI patterns for the creatures. Resistance 2 only seems to have two. Enemies that stand in place and fire their projectile weapons, and critters who just blindly charge you at close range. The only time they differ from this behavior is again when the game wants them to. Enemies are moronic in R2, often failing to react to the player, comically throwing grenades at their own feet, and behaving very erratically when it comes to staying in cover or attacking the player. The only silver lining here is that hybrids and steelheads will occasionally use their weapon's alternative function. I'm not sure what happened here, but Resistance 2 seems to think that chucking an inordinate number of enemies at the player counts towards increasing the scale. But if you don't get their intelligence right, firefights will get stale very quickly. In amongst an uptake in offensive droids that are more annoying than challenging to fight, the second resistance does bring in new Chimeran species, but they are often horribly implemented. Take the Chameleon for example. Clearly inspired by 1987's Predator, this beast has a bloody introduction, but fighting the thing is as basic as it gets. Rather than having it hunt you throughout the stage, you simply listen for rumbling, catch its cloak, and kill it quick before you die instantly. What could have been scary instead feels distinctly cheap. Then you have the lazier enemy types like the Grims and Leeches, both of whom just run at you with no thought put into how they move around the environment. Speaking of dying instantly, you also have the Furies, mutated sharks that kill you in one hit should you step into the water, and for whatever reason, you can't kill them. These foes are designed to artificially restrict movement and force the player onto a clearly defined path. The only decent addition here is the Ravager, a bulky Chimeran shock trooper that rushes you with a sturdy shield. With no vehicle sections or other gameplay styles to be found, it falls to the boss fights to entertain, and their quality varies considerably. Most of them are very scripted, but the Kraken in San Francisco is somewhat memorable. After watching it tear through a serpa base, you fight it on a floating platform, using a powerful pulse cannon to land hits while dodging its drill tentacles. It's very unnerving when it rears up and tries to swallow you whole. Resistance 2 does a fine job of introducing these monsters to the player, but they don't require much in the way of strategy to defeat. Other bosses continue the same trend of simply pumping them full of bullets until they fall. In Idaho, you'll encounter the Mother Spinner atop a tower. This creepy insect looking thing is the source of the leapers you've been fighting, but it goes down after a few magazines from the carbine. The same is true of the Marauder, looking and sounding like a mutated T-Rex with laser beams. Hale takes cover in a house to fight the living tank unit and easily kills it with some shots to the face. Climbing across its body to get to the next area though, that's a neat touch. The much touted Leviathan is probably the game's best boss. Based on previous lore, how many humans must it have taken to create this behemoth? Probably half the population of Chicago, maybe even more. The giant goes down with the lark, but it's still a strong set piece when you drop an exploding skybridge on its head. The bosses offer enjoyment in bursts, but because they form a small part of gameplay, they don't redeem other issues. One thing that Resistance 2 offers that its predecessor didn't is strong environmental variety. The game does feature a wider colour palette, from the lush green forests of Auric to the foreboding interiors of a Chimeran battleship. The game isn't lacking in expansive sites. There's no denying its size, and some of the larger cities, including San Francisco, Idaho and Chicago, deliver some imposing background imagery. The Chimeran ships loom large in the background, with explosions raging in the distance. They drive home the notion that the Serpa forces for all their projects and preparations, are hopelessly outmatched. The same is also true of the music. The trumpets of the original game's soundtrack are given more emphasis here, showing the hellish situation America finds itself in. Of course, this presentation is merely aesthetic in nature, and rarely hides the game's problems. In the latter half of the game, Chicago marks Resistance 2's grandest set-piece, all-out war in the streets. 
but it also demonstrates the game's major pitfalls. Take this scene on the bridge, a horde of hybrids versus American forces. At first glance it looks impressive, but when you play it it's incredibly frustrating. You can't push forward or the Hellfire turrets will cut you down, so instead you have to slog through a wave of mini drones and finally these bullet sponge mini bosses. The only reasonable way to damage them is with the rocket launcher, but to stock up on ammo you must maneuver through a messy pile of mangled cars and put yourself directly in the line of fire to reload. This is Resistance 2 at its most frustrating, and it consistently repeats these moments throughout the campaign. How ironic then that the story's darkest turn is also the game's worst chapter. Returning to Iceland to assault the Chimera's Hola Tower had some potential. The game could have rearranged the prologue's locales to highlight how the enemy took over the Serpa base and made it their own. While we do get a gigantic tower that takes up most of the screen, the gameplay itself reaches its most tedious and frustrating level. You're mostly hunkered behind cover, unable to make your own way forward, and forced to use the specific weapon pickups to progress. Look at this scene. Hail Squad is about to enter the Hola Tower when the game throws a Titan and a horde of Leapers at them. All my ammo for the regular rifles was spent on the previous enemy wave, and the rocket launcher isn't practical, so I have to clumsily run all the way back to the previous skirmish location, grab a new weapon, then finally take out the Leapers. Afterwards, I turn to the Titan, who is just standing there blasting my invulnerable teammate. All of this could have been resolved if Hale was able to carry every weapon at once, which would allow the player to strategize accordingly. When you get inside the tower, things don't get much better as you fight your way through generic black corridors. The assault in Iceland turns out to be a disaster. The Chimera decimate the Serpa forces, and two of Hale's squadmates meet grisly ends, a dark turn of events that set up R2's endgame. The game's final chapters try to convey American society on the verge of complete destruction. I say try because Resistance 2 doesn't really make you feel the final hours of humanity ticking away. Waking up six weeks after the failed attack, and learning he has only three hours before the Chimeran virus consumes him, Hale has a conversation with Capelli, who tells him that the enemy warships, essentially supercharged by the Iceland Tower, have demolished the Liberty defense perimeter in Central America, killed 80 million people and forced the remaining survivors to a single refugee camp in Louisiana. Yet again, there's some squandered potential here. Instead of having Capelli tell Hale the full story, they could have instead gone through the camp to get to the front line. Through gameplay, the player would see the horror on the civilians' faces, perhaps some of them turning away in fear on seeing Nathan's glowing eyes. The biggest problem with Resistance 2's story is that it breaks the show-don't-tell rule time and time again, and this last moment feels particularly egregious. After making your way through the southern swamps, one final effort remains from the battered Serpa forces, a plutonium bomb to destroy the fleet of battleships that have gathered over the Chicks Club crater in Mexico. If they fail, humanity goes extinct. Thematically, this is a great setup for a climax, but the gameplay doesn't get much better. You fight your way through more corridors, experience the limp demise of Richard Blake over radio, and chase down the bomb to Daedalus' lair. I've mostly brushed over him in the story because while he does offer a more tangible, villainous presence to Resistance 2, the former member of Project Abraham doesn't appear often enough to make a memorable impression. The final fight with him, like other bosses, is rather basic. You run away from the large angel shooting at the, ele at the electronic orbs, which the game frequently reminds you to do, by the way, to damage him. At least the game does offer some visual feedback beforehand, as Hale's aim shifts off target with Daedalus attempting to break into his mind. Five hits later, and the supreme master of the Chimeran forces is down for the count. A rather anticlimactic final boss. But it's not the end of the game. After absorbing the monster's powers, Hale makes a run for it, exploding the enemies with a single twitch of his fingers. Like other aspects of the game, it offers some mild enjoyment, but this final escape sequence feels tacked on at best. It's also odd that after absorbing Daedalus' essence, Hale's voice is still perfectly human. Him and Compelli escape the exploding fleet as the only survivors. The Chimera's plan was foiled, but the war in the United States is still lost. Nathan Hale, now fully consumed by the virus, hints at something ominous, a complete takeover of Earth by the vicious creatures. Capelli, knowing his commanding officer is too far gone, knows there is only one thing he can do. It was an honor. With that, the game abruptly ends. 
Rather disappointing in terms of pacing, but to cap off the game's already bleak undertones, the ending functions. Resistance 2 started off with an overwhelming onslaught and ended with no hope left for humanity. It's easily the strongest aspect of a campaign riddled with problems. The middle chapter of the PS3 trilogy, for me personally at least, is the only release from Insomniac Games that felt it had to conform to trends in the gaming industry, and the result shows almost everywhere you look. There were many lacklustre single player modes in 7th generation console shooters, and while R2 isn't the worst I've played, DICE's Battlefield 3 easily takes that title, it just doesn't have much to offer. It's not an awful game, it still runs well without any game breaking bugs or glitches, but I still feel it took the series in the wrong direction. Luckily, the developer recognised these mistakes and set about fixing them for the third and final entry in the franchise. Resistance 3 is a frustrating game in many ways, not because it doesn't function as intended, but because it could have been so much more. 2011 was a very crowded year in gaming, with multiple franchises marking their third entries. We had Battlefield 3, Modern Warfare 3, Uncharted 3, and Gears of War 3 all vying for sales in the closing quarter. On top of this, we also had the return of Deus Ex, continuing adventures in Assassin's Creed Revelations, the highly anticipated Batman Arkham City, and the insanely popular Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. Moreover, the release of Killzone 2 in 2009, and Killzone 3 earlier in 2011 from Guerrilla Games, had supplanted Resistance as the PlayStation 3's flagship shooter franchise. When compared to 2006 and 2008, Resistance 3 had some very stiff competition, and while it released promptly in September 2011, it seemed to get left by the wayside. The game sold 180,000 units in its first month in the US, well below its predecessor which achieved 385,000 over the same time period. It seemed players just weren't interested in what the franchise had to offer at that point. After all that background, Resistance 3 as a product certainly isn't a lackluster effort. Far from it, it's the best entry of the franchise by some distance. The gunplay and core design reach a brutally entertaining high, but as the closing chapter of a trilogy, R3 is very anticlimactic in both story and stakes. It's what I would call a safe game, a title that hops on stage, gives players a quick round of predictable fun, and then quietly moves off for the larger attractions. In short, it's an acceptable matinee, a point where you can tell Insomniac Games wanted to wash their hands at the franchise and move on to new projects. It's a shame too, because I had more fun playing Resistance Free's campaign than any of the previous entries. It succeeds despite the multiplayer taking a step back to a very ho-hum and samey 16 player offering. Plot-wise, however, R3 is far from ideal. The story's problems begin immediately with the opening recap, which flat out tells the player how the Chimera arrived on Earth. Just under 50 years before Resistance 3 begins, the Chimeran virus arrived from space on a large asteroid, wiping out a massive area and sending infection particles out for miles. All it took was one nameless Russian swallowing contaminated soup to start the contagious spread. It would have been far more interesting for the player to go to Russia and discover this for themselves. Does anyone remember the Resistance tech demo from E3 2005? Imagine battling through a grey Russian landscape completely cleansed of all life, generating the eeriest and most foreboding atmosphere in the series. Essentially, it would have been a Metro before Metro 2033 came out. Perhaps this could have been saved for a fourth entry in the franchise. Regretfully, R3 is more content with resting on its laurels and wrapping the series up in a way that feels highly pedestrian. Picking up immediately after the death of Nathan Hale, Resistance 3 portrays an America completely overrun by the Chimera, the survivors banding together in small communities and mostly living underground. Switching the perspective to the most unlikable character of Resistance 2 is a tricky proposition, but like the story's central themes, Resistance 3 makes an admirable, if ineffective, attempt. Joseph Capelli is played in this game by Robin Adkin Downs, who aims to portray the character as a family man with a sense of tired remorse. He's mellowed quite a bit since his army days, being the last remaining sentinel. But here lies the opening second problem. I find it very far-fetched that Joe would be kicked out of Serpa for executing Hale, who was clearly turning into the next Daedalus. Having the armed force simply grow too demoralised and tired to fight on would have been more effective here the soldiers simply taking their vaccines and solemnly returning home to their families. 
This last aspect of the opening is more credible though. It makes sense that Hale's innate resistance to the Chimerian virus would be synthesized into a cure. In response to this, the Chimera starts sending out death squads while they concoct a plan to convert the entire planet into a suitable habitat. A quick glance at the Resistance wiki online reveals that the destruction of the fleet at the end of R2 generated enough energy to open a wormhole above New York. The downtrodden American forces attempted an assault, but were easily beaten back in their final defeat. Four years on from that last effort, and Joe is living with his family in Oklahoma, trying to keep out of the monster's way wherever possible. Eventually, the returning Dr. Malakov arrives and convinces the protagonist to make a dangerous journey to New York in a bid to stop the Chimera's plans. From here, Resistance Free makes its narrative goals clear. This is a more personal story about a man who reluctantly leaves his family to try one last time to save the world. It's a worthy direction to take after the military heavy tones of the first two games, but it doesn't quite deliver on its promise. The central issue is a familiar one, a lack of character development. We're not given much time to get to know Joe and his family, and while the protagonist has changed from his angry ways in Serpa, we just don't get any insight into his thoughts and feelings. The part of the game that best summarizes this chasm comes around two thirds in. We've just been in a claustrophobic and tightly focused boss fight with a burrowing chimera known as Satan. You link up with local priest Jonathan Rose in the mines, and it's a pretty intense fight. You feel genuine danger when confronting this beast, and it's satisfying to blow up its ugly mug with propane tanks, Jaws style. Fire, you son of a But then, after the monster is killed, the game immediately cuts to Joe and Malakoff saying their goodbyes on a train ready to go. I feel like we missed something here. There's no emotive payoff to helping this religious group find their lost leader. That's Resistance 3 in a nutshell, a series of well-crafted gameplay scenarios placed against a story that mostly does the bare minimum to keep things moving along. We have these fleeting moments of reflection which highlight how much Joe misses his wife and son. But because the game never built an emotional connection, the game doesn't fully engage. Resistance 3 is still a good, well thought out FPS. At times it borders on being great. It corrects almost every misstep its predecessor made. The health system has returned to the first resistance, casting off regenerative health entirely and bringing back the back to tanks. Traversing the levels and taking a mental note of where the packs are located is key to survival, and stronger enemies will sometimes drop them on death. Rather than simply hunkering behind cover for most of the game, Resistance 3 encourages movement and the result is a healthy balance of shooting and staying alive. The weapon wheel returns allowing for full strategic gameplay and another layer is added with weapon upgrades. As another idea brought over from Ratchet and Clank, having guns upgrade themselves with use may not make sense in the game setting but it's still a welcome addition. On top of the weapon's alternate abilities, the task of upgrading each armament to level 3 serves even more encouragement as it often puts a new spin on the standard version. The tried and true M5A2 gets a bayonet and the ability to launch 3 grenades at once for example. As for the abilities themselves, they're back to their useful best. New Chimeran weapons like the Deadeye and Wildfire are worthy upgrades to the sniper and rocket launcher archetypes and other firearms like the cryo gun and atomizer can restrict enemy movement, whether it's freezing them solid or pulling them into a gravity well. Rounding off the combat is a set of aesthetical improvements. Chimera lets out distinctive growls on death to give consistent audio feedback. Joseph stumbles and reacts to environmental effects. New enemies are introduced concisely. and every weapon has a distinctive, crunchy sound to it. All these little details come together to form the best shooter gameplay of the franchise. You'll have to use this arsenal sparingly, as enemies in Resistance 3 are highly aggressive. The Chimera themselves are better implemented than they were in Resistance 2. Their AI still isn't up to par when compared to other shooters, but the creatures make up for it this time with their more varied abilities. 
The base hybrids and steelheads are mostly the same, but now you can shoot the cooling units on their back to cause a spontaneous explosion. The hardy ravagers also return, rushing you at close range with their atomizers. Long legs, seemingly an evolution of the slip skulls, dart around the environment and pepper you with bullets. Then you have the brawler, a mini-boss like the titan that rumbles after you relentlessly and must be taken down notch by notch via the removal of its armour. These newer additions broaden the battlefield rather than hamper it. There are no bullet sponge foes to be found here, and each enemy you face reacts appropriately to gunfire. Even brainless enemies like the Grims and Leeches are now articulated better in the way they move around the environment. Later in the game it felt cathartic to bash these abominations in with the sledgehammer. Adding to the level design is a more refined set of environments. When placed against a post-apocalyptic setting, Resistance Free can render locales that feel greatly removed from their human field counterparts. It's very much like War of the Worlds, with exploding alien plant life and disgusting chimeran pods lining the scenery just about everywhere you go. It's a nation in ruin, with plenty to see along Joe's journey. A kraken twice the size of the one you fought in Resistance 2 lies dead in the rivers leading to Louisiana, and chimeran ground troops engage their larger, feral counterparts at specific points in the game. In general, there's a lot of extra detail placed in the background. Wandering around the human settlements, you'll see kids being read stories and families huddled together on the floor. It's a set of closely knit materials that the game's story fails to deliver on. When compared with previous titles, Resistance 3 is a mixture of deep oranges and more saturated colours. Each environment feels distinctive as a result. The same is true of the audio, which places a higher emphasis on horror elements and solemn undertones. With that said, the presentation wasn't flawless. Awkward facial animations in cutscenes and some delays in weapon audio, along with a strange animation for climbing ladders, put some blemish on the overall experience. So, we have gameplay that returns to what made the franchise work and more open-ended level design. What does Resistance 3 do to break up the pace? Offer up a strong and varied collection of set pieces. Resistance Fall of Man and Resistance 2 mostly relied on the same style of combat throughout their campaigns, but R3 works to mix things up. The first level of the game quickly throws you into battle with a stalker, this time with a shield that must be disabled with EMP grenades. You'll alternate between taking cover from its shots and laying on the ammunition until it explodes. Further on, Capelli will, will evade invisible snipers and dropship bombardment to reach safety. Then you have the more open levels where you're free to move around and better leverage the arsenal. This includes defending a pub from a Chimeran onslaught and later battling a feral Widowmaker in a multi-level building. These moments are big improvements from Resistance 2's cramped, overly linear areas and the gameplay is much more engaging as a result. Even the sections on an enclosed area like this boat still offer the player some flexibility. Credit where it's due, the train sequence where Joe and Malakov are chased by a faction of psychotic humans in the latter half of the game is easily the most enjoyable and engaging set piece of the entire series. It may not match the visual flair of Naughty Dog's Uncharted 2, but it's still a ton of fun fending off the thugs who assault the locomotive. You'll blow up vehicles, deal with foes that jump onto the train, and gradually decouple carriages to keep the group off your back. At the end, the game throws a curveball into the mix with a roaming Widowmaker herd that devastates the Wardens, but also derails the train in the process. From here, Resistance Free's campaign reaches its darkest depths as Malakov meets a bloody end and Joe is hauled off to a prison turned gladiatorial arena. Along with the other prisoners, he stages a violent breakout that pits you against human opponents. While they certainly aren't nearly as interesting as the Chimera, the level doesn't outstay its welcome. The prison has a grotty, run-down feel, and as the monsters arrive at the base, Capelli retrieves his weapons and starts battling both sides. The level's conclusion, however, is another example of how Resistance Free squanders its narrative goals. 
The prison's leader, Nick, is a former member of Serpa, just like the protagonist. But of course, the game gives us no time to ponder the directions the two characters took or deepen their backstories. Nick simply gives a passing mention, and then you take him out with a basic quicktime event. Despite everything that's gone wrong, Capelli concludes his long trek. Resistance Free ends, just as Fall of Man did, in a major city covered by snow by the Chimera's A Tower. It's a one-man war against the alien invaders as R3 reaches its most harrowing peak. I played the game on difficult mode and the final level does a great job of making you feel overwhelmed. Leapers with snipers are everywhere and hybrids are always on alert when you enter a new area. As you make your way through the Chimeran hordes, which often number over 15 creatures at once, you'll find bodies and wreckages from the failed Serper attacks four years earlier, and by the end you've got a Goliath bearing down on you. You'd think the protagonist would be as good as dead, but he's saved at the last minute by friendly faces. Much like the first game, Resistance Free does build things up well, but once Capelli enters the lofty terraformer, it's quite a letdown. The architecture feels appropriately unworldly, but the combat doesn't switch itself up to create a powerful finale. What should be the climax of the entire series feels especially muted. With endless waves of enemies bearing down on Joe, you take out four control rods, blow up the main reactor, and run to the exit for a string of quick time events. Nothing more and nothing less. There's no super-powered hive mind boss to face, nor is Hale's ominous prophecy followed up on. Then, that's it. Joe returns safely to his family, and a set of radio transmissions and photographs mark a critical turning point in the war against the Chimera, signaling their defeat around the world. Really? All it took was the destruction of one major US tower? When people talk about bad endings, they normally refer to the likes of Mass Effect 3, the Fable series, and Halo 2. Resistance 3 also belongs on that list for just how rushed it all feels. The destruction of a tower network in Resistance Fall of Man heralded their defeat in Great Britain alone, rather than the entire planet. Perhaps their defeat in the States would signal a turn of the tide, but Resistance was intended to be a trilogy, and that focus ensured that the series ended at number 3, regardless of its story and characters. Overall, the Resistance franchise sits on the middle road of Insomniac's extensive development efforts. The first got the PlayStation 3 out of the gate with a competent effort in both single and multiplayer modes. The second took a giant step backwards by conforming to popular trends. And the third brought the best single player campaign but ended up being an anticlimactic end to the series. Resistance never peaked into blockbuster status, which I feel is down to not being able to offer a fully cohesive experience that engages from start to finish on every level. Even after all my criticism though, the free console games still offer some enjoyment to varying degrees. The series also had two handheld entries, Resistance Retribution for the PSP in 2009, which did quite well, and Resistance Burning Skies in 2012 for the Vita, that apparently did so poorly that there's very little coverage or acknowledgement of its existence. Be that as it may though, Insomniac would press on, and they remain one of the best game developers in the industry. Today, February 28th, 2019, is their 25th birthday, and I can't help but feel a bit sentimental. Having grown up playing Spyro on the PS1, Ratchet and Clank on the PS2, Resistance on the PS3, and most recently Marvel Spider-Man on PS4, few companies have been in the business as long as they have, and there's no doubt they'll continue to put out amazing work. Thanks for watching this first retrospective. For those of you who made it to the end of the video, here's a bit of personal trivia. Back before Resistance 3 came out, my younger self had some crazy ideas on what it could be like. Here it is, Games Master issue 233 under list of demands. 10 player co-op, 80 players online, 4 separate campaigns? Way too ambitious for a 7th generation FPS. But what do you guys think? Which Resistance title was your favourite? Feel free to vote in the poll above and follow my blog at the links in the description.